Est-ce qu'on m'entend dans la salle Voilà. Bonsoir à tous, merci à tous d'être là. Petite, petite remarque d'importance. Si les personnes qui sont devant pouvaient commencer à s'asseoir, ça nous ferait tous très plaisir. On est victime de notre succès, ce qui est une bonne chose. Donc le deuxième étage va être ouvert. Vous pouvez y accéder. For that murder, she knew that person wasn't the person who'd murdered her daughter. She took up the defence of the guy who was being falsely accused. And she transformed her status from victim to survivor. And not only a survivor, but a human rights activist survivor. She started to, to work with uh, relatives and families of uh, disappeared people, um, founded an organisation, started to work on... on Uh, impunity and then managed to research and develop within herself an incredibly deep level of expertise so that now she's managed to help other families who've suffered what she has uh, with forensic expertise with legal support uh, with like psychological support Mexico is such a civilized state a democracy with higher courts with great judgments but it is so uncivilized when it comes to disappearance as torture And despite all the institutions in place, a 98% impunity rate in the country. What is really shocking is the attitude of the, of the system, that there is no real commitment to finding uh, the, the actual perpetrators of these abuses. It is so systematic. So she was very brave in taking up this issue because it is very um, risky to be a human rights defender. Um, particularly at local level in Mexico. We know the complicity of officials from the state level, the, the more local level, as well as in some cases the, the national, the federal level. These are serious problems. The death threats that she faces are, are very serious indeed, and yet she's determined to continue and work not just for justice for her own daughter, but for all the young women who've been killed. So I think her, her candidacy is really very, very significant for us. Cezanne Ngabane is a, a woman human rights defender in KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. She has literally dedicated a lifetime to the quest for equality, for dignity, for rights and for justice for women through education, through training, through legal advice and empowerment across a great diversity of issues from women's rights issues through to land inheritance issues uh, through, to, through to the particular issues Uh, faced by people with HIV AIDS uh, and also the discrimination and, and violence experienced by LGBTI persons in South Africa. She's been able to raise awareness um, in relation to the importance of women's economic um, emancipation and she's done all that in an area, part of, of South Africa, where there have been a lot of challenges in terms of access to land. Um, and her work needs to be located within the broader context of culture. Um, and how one finds that balance between cultural identity um, and rights. Uh, what you see is embezzlement of millions of acres of land where you see an incredible exploitation of this so-called traditional laws to take away land from uh, people, rural people in general, and uh, even more so women. It goes even to the fact that uh Uh, some of these women are evicted from their natal or marital lands uh, after the death of her, their husband, for example. Sazani is a dedicated and passionate woman human rights defender. She's founded a rural women's network, which now is an umbrella organisation of over 500 NGOs. And right across the country, they are training girls and women in what their rights are and how to claim them in traditional courts uh, and elsewhere. In the world, in South Africa, is a better place and women and girls in South Africa are different to the world that is
Donc je vous re... Je vous refais la bienvenue. Donc merci beaucoup à tous d'être là en si grand nombre. Ça nous fait très plaisir pour ce prix 2020, cette cérémonie du prix Martin Ennals. Alors avant de débuter la soirée, un petit peu de musique tout d'abord. Vous savez sans doute que cette édition est placée sous le signe des femmes. Cette formation nananaire est totalement en harmonie avec le thème de, de, cette, de cette année et avant de les écouter, je laisse leur coordinatrice Stéphanie nous dire quelques mots. Bonsoir, bienvenue, nous avons l'honneur d'ouvrir cette cérémonie. Avant de commencer à chanter quelques mots pour nous présenter, la grève des femmes qui a lieu le 14 juin 2019 a rassemblé plus d'un demi-million de femmes et d'hommes solidaires dans toute la Suisse. L'expression de nos revendications a pris une multitude de formes et notre chorale en est un exemple. Nous sommes la chorale féministe Nananer et nous continuons à unir nos voix en public pour porter nos revendications. Ensemble, nous nous redressons, nous reprenons confiance en nous et en notre force. Nous chantons pour l'égalité et la diversité. Nous en avons assez de cet ordre social qui hiérarchise les êtres humains afin de légitimer l'exploitation, la violence et le meurtre. Nos chants animent notre solidarité envers toutes celles et ceux que le système oppresse. Nos chants nous reconnectent les unes aux autres et nous donnent force et espoir. L'amour et la paix triompheront. Merci.
pour qu'on puisse croire qu'il suffit de s'indigner. Il faut que cela s'arrête, on doit pouvoir dire mon père, même en ouvrant sa fenêtre, même en n'ayant pas de clé. Non, non, je ne l'invente pas, moi je dis ce que je dois. Et merci beaucoup à Nananer. Quelques petites informations pratiques encore. Euh, tout d'abord, la cérémonie est filmée, diffusée sur les réseaux sociaux, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Toute personne qui ne souhaite pas être filmée doit contacter les caméramans. Il y en a quelques-uns dans la salle pour leur signifier que vous ne souhaitez pas être filmé. Et j'imagine que tout le monde a des casques, mais si jamais, sachez que nos trois finalistes vont s'exprimer en anglais, en arabe, en espagnol, à moins que vous ne maîtrisiez ces trois langues, soyez bien sûr d'avoir un casque. Dès cela, la directrice de la Fondation Martin Hals va dire quelques mots. Elle arrive par ici. Elle arrive par ici. Je l'attendais de l'autre côté. Je pensais que vous étiez venu de l'autre côté, mais ici nous allons. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great honor to welcome you to the Martin Hals Award Ceremony 2020. 
Mesdames les finalistes du prix Martin Annans, Ms. Madame l'ancienne présidente de la Confédération, Ms. Monsieur uh, le représentant permanent de la Suisse, Mesdames et Messieurs le Grand Conseil, Mesdames et Messieurs les représentants des corps diplomatiques et consulaires, Madame la maire de la ville de Genève, Mesdames et Messieurs les membres du Conseil municipal de la ville de Genève, Mesdames et Messieurs les membres du Conseil de Fondation Martin Annals et du jury du prix Martin Annals Foundation and members of the Martin Ennals Award Jury, ladies and gentlemen, representatives of the Academia, civil society and media, without forgetting, of course, all the students and headmistresses uh, <laughs> of uh, Madame de Stael and Ma Maya. I also want to welcome those of you who are watching us on the live stream in more than dozen, a dozen countries tonight. Welcome. This is the Geneva tradition. I hope that all of you enjoy this tradition because it's a unique one that brings together many different parts of the city with citizens who have come from very far away. I just want to ask before we get started, how many of you have come to the ceremony before? If you could raise your hands, okay. For how many of you is this the first Martin Nano ceremony? Okay, so <laughs> we're many newcomers tonight. That's great. And just a, a trick question is, how many of you have been to more than 10 Martin Nano ceremonies? Can you stand up? Can you stand up? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. <laughs> okay. So for those of us that are new, I, I want to propose a few objectives for all of us uh, tonight. Those of you who've made time in the middle of a very busy week, in the winter and in the rain, to share the stories of Huda, Sisani, and Norma. I'd like to propose that our first objective tonight be the objective of Martin Annals, the original idea behind the award. Martin was a pioneer of the human rights movement. He was an entrepreneur who launched several organizations dedicated to fighting for people's rights. When he passed away in the early 1990s, a group of his admirers came together to form an award. They believed that this award could offer some protection and some value to human rights defenders under stress and at risk. They believed that the more attention and visibility that this award could attract, the more impact and the, the more strengthened the winners of this award would be. Today, we at the foundation, together with the 10 members of the Martin Annals Award jury and our host, the city of Geneva, believe very deeply in this model, that the more of us there are who stand behind Martin Annals finalists, the more protected they will be. But today the world is much more complicated. It's more crowded with information and with demands than it was before. And those who speak the truth can be drowned out by the roar of alternative facts, by fear, by hate. Persons who defend human rights can be thrown in jail, only to be released, only to be thrown back in jail, even when they've been found innocent in the courts of law of their countries. And the consensus which underpins the Universal Declaration on Human Rights is under pressure. So it's not enough anymore to make some noise about an award. What can we do then? And I was thinking about this and I actually took some inspiration from my favorite Puerto Rican poet, Jennifer Lopez, also known as J. Lo, who said in her 1999 hit, she said, let's get loud. Let's get really loud about human rights. And let's be smart about how we send these messages in an ever noisier world. And I didn't meet Martin Ennals, but I don't think he would have disagreed with J. Lo on this point. So let's make that our first objective, that we get really loud and that our support for Huda, Norma, and Sisani is heard where it needs to be heard around the world. And a second objective for us tonight is that we celebrate. Let's celebrate these exceptional women 
And as we recognize them, we'll recognize and celebrate all human rights defenders. The Martin Ennals Network is made up of persons with a deep love for their fellow humanity. They are brave, they have made great sacrifices for others, and they are relentless. They are relentless. What they've made possible on our behalf is a gift that we can celebrate. So if you've come tonight and you're watching the ceremony, it's because in a way you're also a defender of human rights. Thank you for showing up. And I suggest that we do this loudly and smartly and with great joy. Let's defend human rights and celebrate our defenders tonight together. Now, please help me welcome loudly our close partner and co-host in this celebration, the mayor of Geneva, Madame Sandrine Salerno. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it's a great honor for me to take the floor before you this evening for this uh, ceremony of the Martin Ennals Award. This year, again, this uh, reward will bring light, shed light on persons that are out of commerce, who are distinguished by the strength of uh, their work and their courage. And although human rights are still being attacked everywhere, despite that those who defend them haven't as ever before been in danger, this award is more than ever essential. And therefore, I am particularly proud and happy today that Geneva, the international city of human rights, be once again, and for many years to come, one of the main uh, organizers of this event, part of this 26th edition, for the first time in this award, three exceptional women have been selected by the international jury. I would like to warmly welcome this choice. You know that I am highly attached to issues of equality and the role women have in all spheres of society. We know that one of the most important transformations of the 20th century is linked to the world recognition of the fact that female and women rights and gender equality are legitimate objectives. This huge change is not by hazard. It's the result of a very determined word, work of very brave uh, women. Their activism, their defense, and the amazing progress they've reached have changed forever the way we see social justice and the different ways of discrimination, violence based on gender is now under attack even though they seemed normal in the past. Everywhere in the world, women are fighting with strength for their fundamental rights. A global movement that also can be found in Switzerland in June 2019 500,000 women went on strike in our country to claim for equality now and forever in all sectors of society. Activists, students, retirees, trade unionists, mothers, migrants, they all carried together the basic reivindications and we must recall that when women stop, world also stops. If the situation in Switzerland can seem positive, of course, if we compare it to what can be happening in other regions of the world, we must not forget tonight that every day women in our country are suffering discrimination, stereotypes, abuse, gender violence in the streets, in transport, at work, in their intimacy of the personal lives. Because Gender discrimination is a structural problem that has no borders, whether they be economic, social, cultural, geographical borders, and that it represents one of the most frequent violence against rights. Ladies and gentlemen, in a world context of a 
critical uh, resistance to gender equality we have seen in certain countries by a collective of extremism which is uh, focusing on the, the bodies and identities of women. The choice of the International Jury of the Martin Ennels Award reminds us the situation and the very specific dangers that human rights activists have to face in, men, in many countries. If, like men, they are threatened, attacked, arbitrarily detained and sometimes even murdered, these women also face very specific abuse because of their gender and the topics they fight against. And they expose themselves to physical, verbal uh, uh, violence or even sexual violence used as a means of torture. Doubting sometimes the cultural norms, the patriarchies, the norms and the stereotypes, the women who defend human rights may be facing hostile reactions because of their femininity or because they decide to express their opinion in the public sphere. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Geneva authorities, it's with great emotion and uh, warmth that I would like to congratulate the three finalists, Ms. Huda Al-Sahari, Ms. Norma Ledesma and Ms. Sizani Gubane for their courage, which they have proved uh, to carry with great pride. I hope that with this award we will be able to encourage the power that human rights activists have in their own countries and that we will allow them to carry on getting their causes to progress. Their conviction and the strength of their actions strengthens the respect we have for them. I would like to thank as well the members of the Martin Ennels Award. I would like to uh, thank this very important foundation for the work they carry out. And I would like to congratulate as well Miss Isabel de Sola for the, her recent uh, naming as director of the foundation and thank you all. Thank you for being here tonight. Your presence is one of the best ways to show how important human dignity and justice are for us. Let's not forget that men and women who defend human rights are those who are in fighting against the violations against our uh, human rights. Let's remember as well what our individual responsibility is. Let's leave behind defeat. Let's get up and fight for our rights, for equality, because peace and equality will be uh, what we win. Thank you to all for being here. So soon uh, we'll be able to meet the three finalists of this award. We'll be introducing them one by one. We'll then have a 20-minute discussion with them in order to be able to get to know them, to know what their everyday life is. And we will then move on to uh, the presentation of the award. It will be uh, Ms. Michele Bachelet, a UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, who will be uh, presenting them with the award. I would like to now present on the uh, panel Ms. Huda Al Sarari. Huda Al-Sarari is a lawyer in Yemen. She has been working for many years uh, as an advocate for human rights and female rights. It's one of the countries where that is suffering one of the biggest uh, crises in the world. Her life is under threat, and this is her portrait in images.
بدات تصنع مجموعه من الشكاوى من الامهات والاهالي انه يتم اختطاف اولادهم في اوقات متاخره من الليل طبعا كانت هذه المداهمات تحدث ما بين الساعة الثانية عشر ليلا إلى الساعة الثالثة فجرا وهذه كانت ضد الإجراءات القانونية المتعارف عليها في التشريعات اليمنية وبما أننا محامين كنا متنبهين إلى هذه النقطة أنه تتم المداهمات من غير أي مصوغات قانونية هي الجهة التي سوف تساعدهم كل الجهات أو السلطات القائمة في محافظة عدن كانت تنفي صلتها بما يحدث وكانت تنفي أنها تقوم بعملية المداهمات هذا هو ما شدني للعمل في هذا الملف أنه لا أحد تكلم بهذا الانتهاك ولا أحد يستطيع الولوج طبعا الأمهات أو الأهالي بشكل عام يعني ما كانوا يعرفوا إلا فين يتجهوا كانت تصير المداهمات بشكل مفزع يتم إطلاق أعيرة نارية يتم سرقة المحتويات المنزل البعض يقول أنهم يغطوا وجوههم ولا تظهر غير أعينهم فقط يلبسون ملابس سوداء كانوا يحملون أسلحة متوسطة مثل الأربيجي الرشاشات تشاهد هنا في المقطع كيف المعتقل معصب العينين كيف يتم إجلاس المعتقلين بصورة مهينة جدا ومعاملتهم معاملة غير إنسانية كوننا قاعدة بيانات يعني كبيرة جدا من هي القوات التي قامت بالاعتقال حاولنا تحديد ما هي المواقع التي يتم اعتقال الأشخاص واحتجازهم فيها ساعدتنا وكالة الأسوشيت بيرس عندما زارت عدن ساعدتنا كثير التقارير أيضا الدولية التي صدرت من هيومن رايتس ووتش Human Rights Watch says there are at least 18 secret prisons run by UAE forces in southern Yemen. Human Rights Watch says the UAE has been arming and training Yemeni special forces to fight local branches of Al-Qaeda and ISIL. It's documented dozens of cases of people, including children, who were detained by those forces and may have been subjected to torture. أني أول شخص من منظمات مجتمع مدني أو أول ناشطة تكلمت عن موضوع السجون السرية داخل عدن وكانت هناك ضجة كبيرة عندما تحدث وبعض المواقع الإعلامية تعرضت لحملة تشهير كبيرة جدا في وسائل الإعلام تلقيت أنا شخصيا تهديدات كنت خائفة جدا استمع إلى شكوى أمهات المعتقلين عما يتعرض له أولادهم أرجع إلى البيت أجري وأقفل الباب علي خوفا من أنه حد يلاحقني لم يقف أحدا بجانبي تعرض ولدي إلى إطلاق النار في محافظة عدن قد يكون متعمد وقد يكون لا طالبت بالتحقيق في قضية ولدي لكن للأسف لا ت... لم تساعدني أجهزة الأمن في ذلك لدي أمهات مكلومات خاصة بعد فقدان ولدي صرت أشعر بألم ويعني غصة الأمهات لفقدانها لأولادهن طبعا الأمهات ما كانوا يستطيعوا يخرجوا يتكلموا لكن الأمهات صاروا يوم قويات صار هناك رابطة رسمية باسم أمهات المختطفين والمعتقلين
لديها أيضا حتى مواقع على وسائل التواصل الاجتماعية مثل تويتر الفيس بعد ما كنت أشعر بالخوف بعد ما كنت أشعر بالضعف الآن صرت أستمد قوتي وعزيمتي وإرادتي عندما أرى الأمهات بهذه القوة يتحدثن عندما أرى الأمهات بهذه الصلابة أعتقدش إنه سوف أتوقف بيوم عن الأيام عن عملي بالعكس تماما العمل في مجال حقوق الإنسان لا يتوقف عند حد معين أو عند مجال معين بالتالي حتى لو إن توقف الانتهاكات ولنفترض إنه الانتهاكات قد توقفت هناك يجب أن يكون جبر ضرر الضحايا هناك منتهكين انتهكوا حقوق الإنسان يجب أن يعاقبوا ننتقل إلى مرحلة أخرى من العمل قبر الضحى ضرر الضحايا معاقبة المنتهكين وإحالتهم إلى القضاء حتى ينالوا جزاءهم عما ارتكبوه من انتهاكات بحق المواطنين البسطاء وبالتالي ما أعتقدش أنه عملنا كمدافعين سوف يتوقف بيوم من الأيام بالعكس We will now like to welcome our second finalist, Ms. Norma Ledesma, who will also come up to the podium. Norma Ledesma comes from Chihuahua in Mexico and she wasn't destined to work in the law field but the day her daughter disappeared like unfortunately many other daughters, many other girls, unfortunately that's a very sad fact of Chihuahua well then Norma became the voice of hundreds of mothers and fathers, she founded and also leads uh, Justicia para Nuestras, she has justice for our daughters and she has also been threatened on several occasions uh, because of her activism in the last 15 years and this is her portrait this is her story he visto morir compañeras compañeros defensores de derechos humanos desde entonces tengo guardaespaldas han sido una serie de amenazas hasta he recibido balazos en la casa hay comandantes que se han acercado a decirme vamos a ser prudentes Y yo siempre les contesto, las víctimas que yo represento ¿no? siguen esperando encontrar a su familiar. Nosotros no podemos descansar mientras que no le entreguemos la verdad a esa familia. Yo trabajaba en una maquiladora con un esposo, dos hijos, la niña Paloma de 16 años, Fabián, mi hijo de 12. Paloma trabajaba también conmigo en la maquiladora y estudiaba un diplomado de computación. El 2 de marzo del 2002, Paloma a las 3.15 de la tarde se despide de nosotros. Ella tenía que haber regresado a las 8 y media. Y a las nueve, Paloma no había llegado. La buscamos toda la noche por los caminos, por los periféricos, por las calles, por si algo le hubiera pasado. 
en todos los hospitales, pero pues nadie sabía nada. Nos fuimos a ponerle el reporte de denuncia, nos dijeron que por regla teníamos que esperarnos 72 horas para buscarla, porque seguramente por ahí estaba con alguien. Yo estaba convencida, totalmente convencida, a Paloma se la habían llevado. Y creo que ahí empieza a cambiar mi vida. Yo sentía que algo le había pasado y nadie me estaba ayudando a buscarla. Veintisiete días buscamos a Paloma ininterrumpidamente. Cada día que pasaba, la esperanza de, de no encontrarla era menos. El 29 de marzo se localizó el cuerpo sin vida de una mujer. Mi resistencia normal era, no puede ser Paloma, pero sí era. No sé hasta ahorita qué pasó, quién se la llevó. Le dije, cuando tú naciste, Paloma, yo prometí defenderte contra todo y contra todos y no pude. Pero desde este instante, Empeño la mía, te prometo no dejar de luchar ni un solo día hasta encontrar justicia. La computadora de Paloma fue la primera computadora que usamos. Yo no la sabía usar. Yo solo tenía mi primaria, no sabía lo que era ni siquiera un ratón, un mouse. Duré cinco años estudiando hasta que me recibí de la, con la licenciatura de Derecho. El sabor de la justicia me gustó. Hay momentos que amargan trabajar con el gobierno. Tenía mucho odio a las autoridades, más que a los propios asesinos. Pero después de muchos años, creo que ahora hemos logrado lo que tenemos. Fiscalías especializadas, personas comprometidas, capacitadas. Hay personas con el corazón puesto a servir a la sociedad. Sí, no, adentro de la bodega ya no hay cuerpo. Nos consta porque se metió máquina y todo. Incluso con la máquina descartamos que los Y también había aprendido que el Estado, hasta que alguien con unos ojos externos lo sigue presionando y lo sigue revisando. Aprendimos el camino. Teníamos que mantener los casos con una mirada internacional para que el Estado pudiera bene, eh, beneficiar a la sociedad. Entonces, tenemos que usar las herramientas que tenemos y el gobierno tiene que hacer lo suficiente para reconstruir. Que han sido asesinadas, eh, que continúan sus asesinatos en, en, en la impunidad. Todavía este año hay, al menos ahorita hay como 80 mujeres asesinadas en Chihuahua. Esa es la autoridad aquí en México. Desgraciadamente, a pueblos chicos, a pueblos grandes, a ciudades, a estados como este. Pero todos son los mismos. Tenemos miedo de salir a la calle, la verdad. Yo que más quisiera estar así como ustedes, hablando y no, no, no. Había muchas autoridades, entonces por eso dije yo, no, no voy a, como que. En México, la cultura machista y patriarcal, los hombres eh, se sienten dueños de las mujeres para usarlas y desecharlas. Mi lema es que el conocimiento es poder. Pero la vida nos colocó en una experiencia y en un aprendizaje que ellos no tienen. Aprendimos, no es que aceptemos, aprendimos a vivir con la pérdida de nuestro familiar, de nuestra hija, nuestra hermana. ¿Qué le ayudó? Mi camino. Su camino le puede ayudar al de ella. Su camino le puede ayudar al de ella. Porque las herramientas las tenemos nosotros. Gracias a la señora Norma. Gracias a ella tanto con derechos humanos también, con palabras, porque somos personas sensatas, sino nomás para exigir dónde está su hijo. Son ustedes los que me motivan y todo este proceso que ha pasado, pero que aquí está. Eso lo hace nomás el amor de la madre. El amor que le tengo a mi hijo, el amor por Paloma, 
me ha hecho estar aquí y por lo que hago porque lo que hago lo hago con amor lo hago por convicción lo hago por pasión We now welcome our last Madame finalist, Ms. Zizani Ngubane, Mama Zizani, like she is known in her country, South Africa. Mama Cizani is an activist and has been pretty much all her life. She was shocked about the inequality suffered by women in her province of KwaZulu Natal. She, as an activist within the African National Congress, contributed to the South African Constitution on behalf of rural women, women often suffering patriarchal norms because they are forbidden from land ownership. Her own mother was thrown out of her own house and since then, she's been fighting on behalf of all these women who are currently, still today, being thrown up, and she's fighting for them. This is her portrait. Who should be afraid of me? I think the traditional leaders are afraid of me because they don't even call me by my name. They call me the, the, the woman who hates traditional leaders, which is not the truth. I don't hate them. I hate what they do to the women. They are forcibly evicting people from their land without any constitutional basis. And in our culture, no traditional leader, including the king, could own land. He holds it in custody of the people. It's the people who own the land. And now it's the other way around. The traditional leaders collaborated with the apartheid regime and waged a lot of violence. The government is sensitive about challenging these traditional leaders in case they start another violence in the province. It's not that I'm not scared of them, because I know that they are dangerous, but to stand up on behalf of other women uh, I'm not scared of doing it if I know that I'm doing it on behalf of other people. When a woman has been 
forcibly evicted from her marital or natal home. They give her a ring, and then I join her struggle. You saw no Sam in Gutangum Zalangum fan. Oxon saw no Sam in Ganwipi on Kulunkul. Sakfan and Gubu Tingi leg. Gubanagang Salilang. Amanda was an uncle's wins in her. Was a washroom salad. When I was five years old, at the back of our home, there was an auntie there when her spouse was home. She was beaten up. It, it, and it was usually in the evening. I knew that she was beaten up because I could hear the noise. Boom, boom, boom. And then I would hear the screams. I remember I look at my hands and they looked very small. And my wish was that when I grow up, I could assist her. Because I'm the eldest, I had to drop out of school and try to find a job. I didn't study law at all. I didn't study anything. I didn't get formal education. I made primary school graduate. <laughs> Not too many people like the work I'm doing. I am scared of the night because a group of 10 young men came and attacked me at night and they nearly killed me. They left me thinking I was dead. When we convene workshops, we focusing mainly on knowledge and on publicity without people knowing their rights and their position, it's not easy for them to win these battles. I love my job. I love this fight. I like this struggle, especially when I win the fight. We were very happy to be able to eradicate Ugutwana which is an adoption of young women and girls who are forced into marriages. I didn't want to say to them, what you are doing is not right. But I thought by providing training, intensive trainings on women's human rights, they themselves would say, aha, it means Ugutwala is a human rights violation. Men should learn how to deal with their egos and not take their frustration and make it a problem for women.
we will now be able to tie the advantage of having these three exceptional women with us. One first question for Suzanne, she is the, our eldest um, here tonight. Maybe, maybe a first question, question for you. Sorry, Sorry I was asking it in French. French. <laughs> Maybe, maybe, maybe can you, you tell, tell us, you've been, been doing this for so long, you've been struggling for so long, so long. What, what we're doing here tonight, tonight to be here tonight, to be here in Switzerland, is, is it important for what you do? Does it make a difference? It, it, uh, it does make a very big difference. I will make an example of the time when we initiated the rural women's movement. Women and girls were not allowed to speak in, in public, especially in our in our province. They were not allowed to speak in the presence of, of men. But in like two, three years down the line after the launch of our organization in 1998, women and girls were not only speaking in, in public meetings, they were also speaking in international meetings. So we are very happy to have you tonight. Uh, now I'm going to put my helmet so I can also understand everyone. So I'm going to ask questions to all of you because there are so certain things in your fights that are similar. For example, you Norma and you Huda, you're fighting things that are very secretive, like secret prisons, like nobody, the impunity is massive, you said. So how do you fight? people when no, nobody says I've done it, when you don't know who's responsible. How, how, do you, how do you proceed? How do you address that? Maybe you, Huda? Well, please allow me to explain to you what methodology is used in arrests and detentions in the Aden province. The UIA took the security control of Aden, of the Aden region, and they came in to fight against the Houthi rebels. And at the time, we thought, we hoped that UIA would be able to guarantee security of all citizens, uh, but the contrary is what uh, happened. Uh, currently, uh, we, currently, we have militia, UI, UAE militia, who have carried out raids, attacks in homes late at night. We have shot families and the children have been abducted. As a lawyer, I have received many complaints from the mothers and from the families. I have uh, addressed myself to the authorities, to those those who have to uh, get the law applied, but nothing is being done, unfortunately. And that means that I decided to meet with some of the prisoners, some of the detainees. I gathered some information and I realized there was a network, a network of secret prisons that was being uh, directed from UAE in Yemen. And so I created a massive database, a database database that I couldn't use uh, before the prosecutor's office, uh, before the uh, court. And so I created, thanks to the Associated Press, a sort of public tribunal which allowed me to give and bring forward all the information I had on this issue. I visited the mothers and the families of the victims and I was the, the link between these organizations and the families. Other than Associated Press, there are some other organizations who have uh, focused on this issue, on these illegal prisons, secret prisons. And of course, all the, these crimes and uh, going up, despite everything we've done. But having said that, working with the women and with the wives, with the mothers, and bringing light on this issue has allowed me to free 260 detainees. Today, we are still working on this very complex issue to free even more prisoners who are suffering in the secret prisons so that we know what happens to those who are still in despair. What's interesting also in the struggle of all of you is that in, 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 life, in, in life, 
Sometimes when people are addressing the authorities and the authorities are saying, no, we can't do anything. Well, they go mm -hmm. home and they do nothing. Mm -hmm. And at what point, for example, you, Norma, you decided that wasn't good enough, the answer that you were getting and that you were going to do something about it? Pues, la impotencia... Well, the frustration and the anger is huge. And it's not because the authorities couldn't do anything, it's because they didn't want to. That was the big difference. Because it's easy, uh, lack of will, their incompetence, making sure that it's the families who feel guilty. But against that frustration, that anger, the pain and the love of, for my daughter has always prevailed. So much so that during her disappearance, I learned the different code language for the police people, for the policemen, and I did so in order to be able to try and discover how they were mocking me, really, in order to be able to face up to the government. And that really uh, gave me a standpoint before the government, because I was I, I uncovered the fact that when we found the body of my little girl, she had been raped, she had been tortured, she had been murdered, and she had been thrown uh, to a ditch. The government created an evidence that put someone in jail. And I fought to get that boy out of prison. And I think that that knowledge of their workings, to know how they do that their job, I think that's, that was really my weapon, that was really my secret weapon to fight against them. And I think that my biggest weapon was that love mixed with that huge pain that became a really powerful tool, a really powerful weapon to fight everyone, including government. Would you, would you say, the three of you, that uh, you speak about this love, this love of a mother? I mean, you three are women. It's the first time we have three women here. Do you think that women fight maybe differently? Maybe, Susani? As, as girls, as mothers, as grandmothers, we, we fight differently because the pain would never be the same. We, we the mothers, we the ones who are responsible for raising, for raising our kids, and our response to all these abuses would be completely different from the, from the other sector of our communities. Norma, you had to, to go to school again, to study, to, to study the law. Did you notice a difference in the way you were treated, especially by men afterwards, when you had all this knowledge? In Mexico, in Mexico the macho and culture of patriarchism has been predominant for many centuries. And when my daughter disappeared, I only had my primary schooling. So I decided to go back to school. I went to secondary school. I gave my factory job, actually, and I went to, obviously, university to study a law degree because I thought that that would be a real tool. Knowledge is power. The government makes sure that ignorance and poverty gives them a position of power, power over that society. I finished my law, law degree, I am a lawyer now, but I did that because I needed that extra tool to defend not only my rights and my daughter's rights, but everyone's rights. There's a difference. Maybe there's an added level of respect towards the work I carry out. Uda, you were a lawyer from the beginning? 
and uh, in a in a country where it also the laws are very patriarchal where it must be difficult for a woman what sort of work were you imagining to do at the beginning as a lawyer what drew you to do to that field what drew you to that field بدايه عملي ك اولا بدات عملي كناشطه ومتطوعه في اتحاد النساء Well at the beginning I was an activist and I was uh, working on a voluntary basis in the Aden region on a women's association on the field I met many women whose rights were being violated constantly It's important to know that in Yemen there's absolutely no protection for abused women legislation is really weak and doesn't really protect women's rights the Yemeni society is a patriarchal one and a macho uh, culture and so women don't really benefit from their rights so I finished my degree and decided to study law more in detail. I was at economics first. I went to the bar. I defended uh, imprisoned women. And it's also important to understand in Yemen, it's important that women hold knowledge in order to be able to defend her own rights. The Yemeni, Yemeni female in her family, in society, is being violated constantly. So the woman has to be very strong. And it's important that we have to unite as women in order to be able to defend ourselves and have access to posts of power in order to be able to be with the decision makers. This year you also, last year you had an award, the, the, the award Aurora. Uh, we saw how dangerous the work you are, you, you do. Um, the, the, the award, the Martin Ennals Award is also meaning to actually bring you some protection, some support, but some protection on an every, everyday basis. For the moment, how would you say that the previous award has it helped you? Has it, has it in, in a way protected you? And what do you expect of maybe this light that's been shown, shown upon you? Women activists, human rights activists, are subject to uh, a number of uh, violations. I have been threatened myself for death, death, death threatened. One of my uh, sons has been murdered, the other one has been uh, threatened. And this is why this uh, Martin Ennals Award will grant me a certain level of protection. And maybe through this award, I'll be able to continue with my work and continue defending human rights and protect, defend, support the mothers of these uh, prisoners. We will be launching different uh, initiatives to condemn arbitrary detention and forced disappearances. My association, the one I, I uh, chair, will be creating a legal team in order to make accountable those who uh, should be accountable and defend the plaintiffs. We'll be able to following up on the different uh, files and, and I think that those authorities have to collaborate with us, that's my objective, and we need to make sure we find those who have disappeared. You also you live under, under protection uh, from what I know. What would you, if you could uh, reclaim some sort of freedom, what, what would it be? At the moment, you, how is it on an everyday basis? Do you, do you need, can, are you able to go out freely? Well, I have had my own bodyguard for nine years. And when we are under threat, when we live this life, I, I think you lose your personal life, you lose your personal space, and I am working at the service, it has been now a number of years, my funeral, I've arranged everything for it, I only have one other son, and, and he knows what to do if one day I don't come back home. 
Creo en una I think más allá del sol. that there is freedom beyond the Creo sun. Aquí la I think that que le fue justice, a the justice that my daughter mujeres, didn't get, uh, along with all those no women and girls, a concluir, I don't no think is something I'll be able to see with my own eyes. And so I will fight, I will continue fighting despite my situation, despite the threat for a life of freedom, for a world of freedom, for a world in which women can live free. And despite everything, I have given up my own freedom and I will continue to fight day and night so that all Palomas can go back to their homes. Thank you, Norma. Cisane, you said a very important thing in, in, in the clip that we saw earlier. You said, I don't like to tell women what they have to do. I, I, I like to educate them, and then they know themselves what to do. Do you think that's really the key of, of, of what you're doing, and so that maybe it goes on also after you? Uh, it is a key, and it has worked well for me because I don't, I don't go into a, the community and impose my idea. I create, I facilitate a situation where women could find out for themselves that, aha, what we are doing is unconstitutional. I will make the example of Ugutwana. Ugutwana is a, a harmful cultural practice of the abduction of girls aged between 12 and 17 and young women who are forced into marriages uh, with men much older than them. In 2011, the first community I went and tried to sensitize the women about about women's uh, human rights, not wanting to say to them what you are practicing is, is uncon uh, unconstitutional or it's, it's not accepted, but I wanted them to find out for themselves by conducting series and series of workshops on women and girls' human rights, hoping that it will come out amongst the group of 80 women and two men we were working with. It will come out on its own to, for them to discover that what they were doing was not okay. At that time, when a 12-year-old little girl was adopted by a group of between three and 15 men, women themselves were going out and started singing a song which is say, the cows are coming home. Because these little girls were adopted or they were traded off for marriage in exchange of cows. So even women who went through the same painful process of being raped by the adapter in front of a group of between three and 15 men, of being tortured, and uh, here we're talking about a 12-year-old little girl. So it, it wasn't easy because women were appreciating it and, and seeing it as one of the cultures or a practice which is creating space for women to be able to get married and have their own marital homes and their fathers get the cows. Raising a girl in these communities was mainly about raising her in order for her to get married and her father gets the cow and that's it. She's no more part of the, of the family. With orphans and vulnerable girls, it was even worse for them because their uncles, in their way of not 
taking the responsibility of raising them as girls, they would easily trade them off for marriage. I will make an example of a story of Nonkululego. Nonkululego in our language means democracy, but Nonkululego had never experienced democracy in her lifetime. She lost her parents when she was only four years old and was raised by her grandmother. When she was 14 years old, her uncle had organized with an elderly man to marry her. He came in a, in a car with four men. They made her sit in the middle at the back seat and they took her right up to the mountain in a forest and the uncle drove away with the driver back home and she was left with these men who are not even familiar to her. She was beaten up, she was raped, she was taken to this man's home. The next day, this man, much older than her, drove a head of eight cattle and that was it. The uncle accepted the cattle and she became the wife of this man when she had five kids in this kind of uncultural marriage, she decided to take her own life and left behind five kids. Uh, I can tell so many stories of young women who committed suicide and of young women who are still stuck in those marriages because they are families, especially their male relatives, strongly believe that they are in the right place. And it was an achievement for us to be able to walk the journey with the women through women's human rights workshops until they themselves said this must stop. It was not easy to stop it because even the traditional leaders were getting worried about these women who come and hold meetings under the trees in big numbers, like 100, 150 women, and they had not even asked for permission to hold these meetings. And our lives were threatened, like there was no tomorrow, but because we wanted the community to accept that what they were doing was unconstitutional, we just continued until the practice was eradicated in 2015. We are currently celebrating nine years of zero, 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 zero tolerance of Fukutwala. That is a great achievement. Thank you very much. And thank you so much to the three of you for all the achievement, for all the struggle that you're that you are leading every day. And, and maintenant nous avons l'honneur d'accueillir We now have Michel the Bachelet, honor to have with us uh, Ms. Michelle Bachelet, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, twice over uh, uh, President of uh, Chile and also the first uh, elected president in South America by universal suffrage. Director of uh, UN Women between 2010 and 2013 as well. She's always fought for the rights of women throughout her different mandates, and she will be the one revealing the name of the 2020 laureate of the Martin Ennals Award. Distinguished finalist of the 2020 Martin Ennals Award, colleagues, friends. It is my great pleasure to join you in this ceremony as we reaffirm our commitment to standing up for all human rights, everyone, every day, everywhere. Tonight, we gather to honor the three exceptional women and their storage of courage and principle. Three women who made a difference in their communities and in the world. Please, I will, will please respect the, few, the women who we are. The, please respect, respect the women. No, that's not true, but please respect this woman. No, that's not true. No, that's not true. No, that's not true, but please respect the people who are we're honoring today. If you want to tell me something, we can speak outside. Please respect the people that we are honoring today. Please respect this woman. Please respect this woman. Please respect this woman.
Well, tonight we're going to gather to honor these three exceptional women and their stories of courage and principle. Three women who made a difference in their communities and in the world by standing up for justice and equality and by speaking out against powers and pressures that were often overwhelming. Women human rights defenders have been at the forefront of advance on all human rights as well as of social movements that have benefited all of us. I must say that a woman, as a long life uh, feminist, I'm very happy to be here tonight, the first time that all finalists of the Martin Annals Award are women. Congratulations to you and thank you for your work and commitment. Dear friends, attacks and harassment against all human rights defenders are on the rise in many parts of the world. Women, however, tend to face additional obstacles. They are frequently targeted and attacked for being feminist or simply just because they are women who are speaking up, exercising universal rights, one unfortunately still often believe as not belonging to all. Women human rights defenders are repeatedly seen as threatening the status quo, religion, and traditional notions of family, honor, so-called morality of culture. Please don't be so rude in front of our heroes. You are lacking respect to these women. Honor, honor the person who are here being honored. Well, I'm sorry for all of this. I'm so sorry, but I'm going to finish because I'm really concerned about women here that are having what they have. Women, as a result, they can be subjected to stigmatization, ostracism, and even threats and assault. And as we have seen, women human rights defenders are repeatedly seen as threatening the status quo, religion, and traditional notions of family, honor, so-called morality or culture. All of us know that the journey towards gender equality is still long and challenging, and we must vow to never be complacent. Although we have seen tremendous improvements in the past decades, we're still not where we should be, where we must be. We're seeing a pushback against women's rights and the resurgence of narratives against gender equality based on centuries-long discrimination. We must push back on the pushback and continue to push forward. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, we watch adopted by all member states of the United Nations, recognizes gender equality and the human rights of women and girls as indispensable for building a better future for all. This is a matter for all of us. Civil society has a crucial voice and plays a huge role. Still, for decades, the efforts, the courage, and contribution of women human rights defenders did not receive equal attention. Today's award shows that this is no longer true. We owe this change to women like the three of you who are shaping the future, each in their own way. For more than four decades, Sisane Gubane has been fighting for human rights in her native South Africa and has been pushed for gender equality particularly for rural women, by working on laws, but also through campaigning and advocacy. Norma Ledesma became a human rights defender when her daughter Paloma disappeared on her way home from school in Chihuahua, Mexico. Since her horrific personal experience, she has been fighting for justice for the families and victims of feminicide, disappearance, and human trafficking in her country, and supporting others to do the same. Norma is responsible for the creation of a special prosecutor office for women's victims of violence in her native state of Chihuahua. Huda Al Sarari, a Yemeni human rights lawyer, has been working with local human rights organizations and helped expose arbitrary detention and torture of thousands of men and boys in a network of secret prisons run by foreign governments. Despite numerous threats and defamation campaigns, she keeps pursuing justice. Distinguished fin finalist, I'm impressed and I think all of us are moved by your great courage, your determination, and your commitment to our common humanity. Voicing criticism, looking for inclusive solutions to challenges, and pushing for the space needed by all to fully participate 
in decision making are essential to the progress of society. So thank you for the remarkable efforts for human dignity. Dear friends, tonight we celebrate the respect for our shared values and universal human rights. We celebrate standing up for them in often hostile environments. We celebrate the efforts to advance them. So it is now my great honor to announce this year's laureate of Martin Arnold's War, Ms. Huda Al-Sarari. <laughs> Dear Ms. Huda Al-Sarari. <laughs> you are an inspiration of human rights, well, generation of human rights defenders in your community and beyond. This prize is a recognition of your struggle and it's a public sign of support to you and all human rights defenders all over the world. I send you my heartfelt congratulations and thank you for standing up for human rights. Shukran. أود أن أتقدم بالشكر إلى منظمة المارتن إينيلز لتكريمي في Please هذا اليوم وتقديم هذه الجائزة. أود أن أتقدم بالشكر لأسرتي التي وقفت بجانبي uh, despite everything I've gone through, I would like to also thank Norma and Suzanne for everything that they have done and they do for their victims. I have the feeling that their sacrifice is a sacrifice that I would have never been able to go through. Uh, it would have been unbearable for me, so thank you, thank you. This award goes to the women, the wives of all disappeared, the arbitrary disappearances, those mothers, those wives who try day and night to know what's happened to their husbands, to their sons. These um, families, these mothers live in fear because of those night raids organized by the militia who work with UAI. E. I would like to also give this award to my son, uh, Mohamed, who's not here with us anymore. He's always been my dearest and he's no longer with us. Ladies and gentlemen, after the freedom of the Aden uh, province by the Uti rebels, the uh, Emiratis controlled the security in this province and we thought, we hoped at the time that the Arab Emirates would be able to establish a rule of law, but quite the contrary. The UAE organized militia who work against the law, and we've seen many clandestine groups organized with secret prisons put in place where detainees are not granted their most fundamental rights and we don't have access to these secret prisons. When I discovered the existence of this secret network organized by the UAE and the militia organized by them, I had to uh, take them to court, but I couldn't. So I created this public court with all the mothers, with all the families of these people. We were able to free 260 de de detainees. I would like to thank Human Rights Watch, Human Rights International, and Am Am Associated Press, who uh, gave light to this file. And again, there's still 2,000 people suffering uh, in these secret prisons. And that's why I would like to ask you, you, the international press, the diplomats, the people work in favor of freeing, liberating these innocent people. Ladies and gentlemen, the UAE are 
working with uh, the Trump administration, with uh, their international connections. But I am a mother who's lost a child, and I have seen what the uh, Arab Emirates are doing. I've seen what the militia is doing. And no country would be proud to have a relationship, a working relationship with the UAE if they knew this. I have talked to the mothers, and uh, it's important that you do not put your economic benefits, your financial benefits, before the human rights issue. There is no uh, prosecutor's office, there's no rule of law in this country. So what I'm asking today is make sure that the dignity of these people prevail. I would like to alert you on the fact that the way the workings of the UAE is similar to what the Uti rebels were doing. There is an organized will to destroy uh, the uh, Yemeni uh, authorities. And the Uti are also violating, acting against the activists, the journalists, the population. They've acted in ways I never thought would be possible. And so we have to talk openly. We have to denounce the Uti rebels and the militia to make sure the rule of law and justice prevail. I dream of a world, of a country where the rights of the Yemeni people prevail. Thank you. Well done, Uda. Well done as well to our two finalists, who them are being honored here today. I would like to welcome Hans Tulen, president of the jury of the Martin Ennels Foundation, to uh, present them, the two finalists, with their award. He uh, is always there, and he has done an excellent job, as well as Ms. Sandrine Salerno, mayor of Geneva. Norma, maybe, will come. <laughs> can come here, it's better for the picture. <laughs> Good evening. As you can see, I'm the only male participant tonight. And that's a great honor, and I accept it uh, gracefully. Um, before I do my duty and give the award, um, I want to address a very recent event. And one of the advantages of being so old and involved in human rights, I want to recall you in 1993, we created the Martha Annals, we announced the Martha Annals Award, during the Vienna Conference on Human Rights, the BIC. And there was a NGO meeting downstairs that I participated in, and where they had asked President Carter to explain more about his human rights policy. He was not able to speak really properly because he was being booed by a small number of dissident Latinos. 
now what happened? And that's, I hope I can do the same. Asma Jahangir, a Pakistani human rights defender who died only uh, two years ago, and who I didn't know at that moment. Later, she became one of the laureates of the Martin Ellis Award. She stood up, addressed a crowd of 2,000 non-governmental activists, and she said, you should be ashamed of yourself. We defend the freedom to speak. You should have let Mr. Carter say. You should let him speak. And then, only then, did the NGOs, who may have agreed with the interruption, agreed that there is a principle at stake. And I want to recall that moment now, because I feel very strongly that whatever the issue is, you do not, as human rights defender, stop other human rights defenders from getting recognized. Okay, that was a uh, spontaneous intermezzo. Now I do my real work <laughs> with great pleasure. And this woman here, Fizani, who you have seen, exceptionally uh, active for so many years, on her own, a one-man shop, one woman shop. And she is able to drag all these women along and make it into a large movement. She told me yesterday that if she got some money from the award, she would use it to build a wall to protect the farm where she wants to meet with the other women because they were already attacked in the house without the protection. I think it was such a nice illustration of how concrete, concrete protection can be. So, Zizani, may I give you this award? You deserve it, and you do all your work. You do all your work with a smile that can make our Bishop Tutu jealous. Now, this year, Isabel has told me it's going to be different. The end, it is the end, almost. We will have a, an, a bit of informal uh, meeting afterwards. But to end all of this, she had the idea we make a bit of a nice, happy, cha chaotic scene on the stage where people can make selfies of each other and maybe other people. And that's, of course, the people are the three laureates, the, the three finalists that are already here, the speaker, Madame Salerno is here, the High Commissioner, please, and I want to invite a representative of each of the 10 NGOs on the jury of the Martin Ennals Award. Please come on stage. We will just mill around and take pictures. Please come now. I think the idea is also that you, too, also be able to be part of the photograph. This could be seen as a standing ovation for our finalists before we go to the reception. So please do not leave the room because we want you there. We want, you, we want to be able to see you on those selfies, too.
Donc vous avez compris que vous êtes dans la photo Have you all understood that you're going to be in the photographs too so you got to sort of look like you are taking stock of what's going on maybe stand up As soon as we're ready for the photograph, I think we can do a standing ovation. That would be that, that selfie with everyone in it. Il faut prendre plusieurs appareils photo, on va pas s'en sortir. Hein. Ok, faut, sorry, apparently partir, we hein. need to take a few more uh, devices to take those selfies. Maybe we should still be clapping. Avant d'aller vous sustenter, je vous demande encore un peu de Before you move to the cocktail reception, I would like to ask you to be more patient because we still have two songs by the Nanane Choir. Ne partez pas, ne partez pas. Please do not leave. Seul. They're not going to be singing if there's no one in the room. Allez, allez les nanas. Come on, girls. J'y arrive pas moi toute seule. Hein? <laughs> I'm trying to motivate everyone, but it's difficult to do it on my own. Let's go.
est là-bas. Ah, on m'aura entend. Merci au Nananer. Thank you very much Merci to pour votre the musique. Nananer Choir. Et Thank you very much for your seul, music. And as you have probably already found out, the city of Geneva is inviting you to a reception call, and we'll see you next year.